Hey everyone, welcome back to an episode of Ask GN. It's been a little while with all the video cards and CPUs and things. The format of this series, if you haven't seen it before, is leave a question below, or if you're one of our Patreon Discord members, you can leave a question there in the Ask GN channel. We'll address it if, uh, if we can get to it in the next video. Uh, another thing to point out here, this is a different set layout than normally. We're just kind of playing around with things, trying to get the brains going on different options, and uh, although this is probably not a permanent set layout, this is actually a functional like area where we work. So it's part of the actual everyday process. Uh, but this has given me a few ideas. So cool stuff for the future. Uh, starting out, we have some questions about overclocking, questions about heat on VRM components, things like that. Uh, some questions that were about AIOs and CLCs. We'll get through all of that. Before getting to those, this coverage is brought to you by EVGA and their 1080 Ti SC2, which we've recommended fairly highly for its build quality and uh, the ICX sensors, which are kind of fun to play with. You can check our full SC2 review for the 1080 Ti if you're curious to learn more, or you can click the link in the description below to find the product page for the 1080 Ti SC2. Getting into the content, uh, before the first question, I've got a box from NZXT. This is continuing our NZXT storyline. They just sent another box of things. So uh, we've got the Kraken G12s. Probably going to be reviewing these pretty soon. I have to get around to these, but we've got a lot of, actually, I have like three or four other of the liquid cooler video card mods behind me that I can do too. So we've got these that came in. We have a white and a black model which I believe are the only two that they're shipping, but the white one is, uh, is pretty good for some flair if you've got a white and black case, so that might be kind of fun to play around with. We'll get to those eventually. More importantly, to NZXT anyway, is that they have sent another puck. Uh, so this is now, our, our, now probably our fourth or fifth puck that they've sent us. If you don't know the beginning of the storyline, we'll, I guess, flash in a quick playback of the S340 Elite review, where I said that the puck was a... Uh, it is uh, literally a piece of rubber with magnets in it. They're very happy about it, and it does this. Check this out. Might have missed it, but it's stuck to the front of the case now. And ever since saying that, they've sent us lots of pucks. So, uh, I guess we've got another one. I don't know if this one's a different color or not. Most of the others are black and white. Yeah, you know, what I've been saying is we should probably just give some of these away on Patreon or something like that. Yeah, this is a blue one. Actually, it looks pretty good. Now, uh, I'm going to hold my ground and not use it because I said I wouldn't in the review, but the blue looks good. All right, so enough NZXT. We've, we, we've encouraged their bad behavior enough. Uh, first question is from Discord, and I, I don't have uh, your name written down. But the, the question from Discord says, something I've been curious to get your opinion on, if low noise operation in a gaming rig is a primary goal, would you generally recommend an AIB air cooler, like the FTW3, for example, which we just reviewed, or an AIO hybrid solution, like any of your GN hybrid builds? I don't have a ton of experience with AIOs, and I'm concerned about idle noise being a nuisance when working. But I've also heard that idle noise on modern AIOs is negligible, and there are only benefits to putting an AIO on the GPU during gaming. What would you suggest? Uh, so this is a good question. We talked about this a bit with the Titan XP hybrid mod, where one of the tests I ran had the uh, radiator fan at 40% and the VRM fan at 23%, and temperatures were great. They were better than the stock card. Uh, but if you run it at 100% out of the box, which is what it's going to do, then it's definitely pretty loud. The AIO is like the one on this mod we have here, which is a, what is this? 1080 Ti, I think. Might be a 1080. But this one, we've got the EVGA radiator on it. These are kits you can buy for 100 bucks. They come with a shroud, which we obviously didn't use. This fan does run a bit loud when it's at 100%, which is going to be basically all the time. Uh, so the solution is when you buy one of these kits, you replace the fan or you run an extension cable to the fan and you plug it into the motherboard instead, and then you can control your fan speeds a bit better. So uh, what we've done is set it to like 40%. The temperatures are still around 50 C. They're lower than an air cooler, and they're quieter. They were less than 40 dBA, I think, in our testing for the Titan XP, but you can view those results for more on that. Uh, so the idle noise, though, that is going to be limited. I mean, your noise is basically the same no matter what, because unless you get like a PWM fan and build a curve for it, 
you're running at a fixed percentage. So your idle is going to be the same as your load noise. Uh, so if you're at 39 dBA, uh, then that's definitely going to be louder than something like an SC2 or an FTW3 or any non-EVGA card like Twin Frozer cards when they spin down to zero RPM under no load. You're going to be louder than those cards. So if your noise floor is like 26 dBA and you have a bunch of passive or nearly passive components, uh, then the only thing making noise is going to be the radiator fan. And so yes, that would be louder. Uh, the pump noise itself, I don't notice it. I know people who say they do. You could definitely notice it if you mount this incorrectly or if you're just unlucky maybe. Like if you take one of these and mount it at the bottom of your case, so you got the video card like that, and this is down there, that is inadvisable <laughs> because now uh, you've got, well, actually I'll talk about this more in one of the questions in here. Uh, but now your barbs are going to be kind of uh, near an air pocket, potentially. So that would suck air through and create noise. Uh, but to answer your question of uh, noise levels, it comes down to tuning the fan curve. What I like to do personally is, uh, like with our render machine, I would take something like this, like a hybrid mod DIY approach, manually, uh, well, swap the fan with something better, plug it into the motherboard, and then build a curve in the motherboard if that permits you to. Uh, and then at that point, you can hopefully run nearly idle, uh, with nearly zero RPM idle, and you would have way lower load, load noise levels, uh, lower temperatures, maybe slightly louder idle noise levels. Not a bad trade overall. So that's kind of my thoughts on it. Next question, uh, I believe also from Discord, Serpent XSF says, uh, ask Jan question on the Gigabyte or Card Extreme Edition or not. What was you? Oh, this is referring to our our uh, review. What was used to overclock it after burner or its graphics engine? Any others? What if any would you recommend using to overclock? Also, I agree. No point in buying a card that is 750 plus, as all of the cards 1080 Ti are borderline on thermal power uh, limit anyway. Um, so the first part of this is uh, what do we use to overclock the Oris card? I. I think we probably used Afterburner, but it may have been Precision. Depends on whichever was the newest at the time. Uh, they're really all the same for the most part. Uh, I use, I, you have to use Precision for these EVGA cards with the ICX stuff, otherwise you're not going to get anything out of the, the thermistors because Afterburner and none of the others, they don't recognize them. They don't know that they exist. So you have to use Precision for the ICX cards. Really, other than that, it doesn't matter a whole lot. It's just kind of which interface do you feel like is the best or which one's the most up to date. Afterburner is good. You need to make sure you go into the settings and toggle a few of the things before really getting into it, like the voltage uh, control and limitations, which you're facing anyway with Pascal. Um, I do like Afterburner because it's, I, I guess I'm just familiar with it. And that's really all it comes down to, it with, like with any other tool. Precision I use for ICX cards, Afterburner for pretty much everything else. Um, it doesn't matter a whole lot because at the end of the day, you're tuning the same options really no matter what. Uh, it's just, you know, where are they in the UI? Next, uh, next part of this, what would you recommend? I mean, after render precision, whatever you feel like, I guess. Uh, next question was from, oh, this is actually the same question from a YouTube commenter who's a Death Grip fan said, when you and the crew at GN overclock your PCs, what programs do you use to check stability of your OC? And when do you consider it to be a stable OC? So I've got you the, the tools for GPUs. For CPUs, I use BIOS only, UEFI exclusively. I don't use Ryzen Master or any other in OS software because I don't trust it. Uh, BIOS only for me. Uh, in terms of testing the stability, there are a few options. So uh, for memory, you can. there are some uh, crunching, crunching tools we used when doing the memory training for Ryzen and like pi tools where you just calculate pi or find uh, values. Those are good for memory overclocking because they, like super pi I think is one of them we may have used. Um, those are good because they find instability very fast and if that's all you're searching for is, uh, is it unstable and if so I need to reboot and change the settings, then that's a good tool. For CPUs and GPUs, uh, GPUs I will burn in on a few different tools. So I actually find that games are a little bit better at finding instability on GPUs than synthetics. So 3D Mark will not always find instability, whereas The Witcher 3 does every single time. So uh, my overclock with a GPU might look fine in 3D Mark, 
but then we run The Witcher 3 or something like that, or Ghost Recon Wildlands, and it crashes in like a minute. Um, and that's just because of how the clock is enumerated. So Fermark is another great example. With Fermark, you can really make it look like your offset is stable. And that's because one, Fermark is seriously stressing the power component, so your clock doesn't boost as high, uh, so the offset doesn't push it as far. And two, if you look at the clock, it is a fixed clock rate in Fermark nonstop. So if you're at like 2012, it's 2012 megahertz the whole way through with no real dips. Whereas in a game, you get spikiness, and that spikiness is when you can encounter instability. So Fermark is not a great tool for stability testing with overclocking in my experience. I would use a mix of 3 mark stress test during initial setup and then games on loop uh, to, to finalize things. CPUs, in the past I've used Prime95 quite a bit. I'm starting to move away from it a little bit at this point, but Prime is still good. Uh, Linpack X is, or Linux is good, not Linux, but Linux. Uh, some tools like that, basically anything that generates a lot of heat. Now they do stress different parts, so like some will do AVX testing, whereas others might not. That's a difference depending on what you're testing for your overclock. Um, but hopefully that gives you a couple tools to look into. Next question is FitzWM. Uh, this looks like a Discord one, whereas Death Grip Fan was a YouTube comp question. FitzWM says, not sure if this is asking you material, but hey, I got a great deal on a 1080, or 1080 hybrid kit from a friend. I was thinking about modding the shroud for my TI. I know I don't need it, but uh, hey, new things. I don't have a Dremel though, and I've never used one before. How hard is it? Is there a kit you'd recommend for a noob? Uh, I've used Dremels for case mods a lot in the past. I used to do a lot of case mods before we really did YouTube videos. Uh, I have used them on bikes a lot. I've used them on computer parts a lot. The Dremel's a great tool to have around. Uh, I'm not gonna really, I'm not gonna go recommend specific kits, but um, generally just from glancing through Amazon, a lot of the 100 to $120 kits look like good starters. The one I have I think was about 200 bucks and it's had absolutely no problems at all. Uh, I think it's actually just a Dremel like brand Dremel kit. Um, it's just replaceable bits. You swap the bit to something that'll cut the material you're cutting better than whatever's on there and you should be good to go. It's great to use a tiny, small, rotating saw more or less. And if you're trying to cut through something like this, that's probably exactly the right tool to do because you could, if you had the original like top part of the shroud, you'd basically cut a hole right here where these uh, the tubes are, cut a hole out and route it through there. Uh, it shouldn't be a big deal. Um, next question is, uh, we've got two options here. Let's, let's go with this one first. Um, so Rarson said on Discord, with the drastically reduced temperatures using the hybrid mod, does that have any long-term implications as to how long the cards last? I would assume being able to remove a large amount of heat might mean that the solder joints on the cards are less stressed. I see broken solder joints all the time, especially on electronics from around 2006 or so, when the switch to lead-free solder was made. Uh, while it's less of a concern these days, I still think thermal transients wreak havoc on solder joints from what I've seen. So I would think keeping the GPU much cooler would help long-term life of the card. I understand this is a complex question and can't be practically answered. Uh, yeah, so that's we've talked about this before. Thermal impact on uh, product life is really hard to measure. There are formulas you can use. The companies that do this kind of testing, like actual stress testing, Acetec, for example, does it on their coolers. They accelerate it, and we did this at Dell when I was there too. You basically, you have chambers, uh, there are different ways to do it. So uh, where I worked, there was a shock and vibe lab. You have shock and vibration tables that just hammer the crap out of the product to try and see if it'll break from different amounts of known force. Uh, there were drop testing rigs. You see if they break from different drop heights, things like that. Um, and then there were also thermal chambers. And so the chambers that I've worked with in the past or I've seen uh, at most of the companies we work with today, they do hot and cold testing. So they put these products through various hot and cold cycles, just cycling them faster than you would in real life because the seasons change uh, at a at very slow pace. Um, so they cycle them for different environments, like you might be testing for ruggedized PCs that will go to uh, the Middle East or for PCs that might go to the Arctic or something like that. What they also do is they run thermal cycles to stress test for how heat might impact components over time 
where you have uh, expansion and contraction of things on the card as it's going through these hot and cold cycles. Because if you burn up to, let's say, 90C on a component or a bunch of components on the board, and then you cool down rapidly to something like 50C or maybe even down to ambient if you turn it off, that's going to at least have some impact on, uh, on how the, the components on the board are reacting to the temperature. So um, the way they normally do it is hot and cold cycling. Now, uh, that means that I don't have a good answer for you because doing this kind of testing without a large sample size and a long amount of time and a lot of equipment, it's basically impossible to answer how long will this survive versus the air-cooled variant. I don't have an answer for you. That said, I think both will probably outlive the usable life of the system, uh, which is ultimately what you're looking at. So if you're building a computer and you tend to replace even in something like five years, the, the reference card or the liquid cooled card will outlive that service life. Uh, the one place that might not be true is this radiator. You'd probably replace that at about five years. But otherwise, I don't, I don't think the extra life you get from running cooler will necessarily be noticeable. Maybe if it's in a super long deployment or you hope to pull it off a shelf uh, 10 or 15 years later, it would matter. But uh, I, I have no reasonable way of predicting that for you. Um, running cooler is generally better for most components except things like flash, the NAND. Uh, but um, how much better is it? Hard to say. Next question. Uh, Jessica Gifford said, Steve, you mentioned when installing an AIO cooler vertically to put the tubes going out the bottom for quieter pump noise. So what I'm wondering is if you install it going out the bottom or uh, if you install the AIO cooler horizontally at the top of the case with the tubes pointing down, how does that affect the pump compared to vertically as described? So uh, I've spoken to a few people about this, like suppliers to, to better understand this over the years. Uh, this is more an issue with CLCs and AIOs than with open loop coolers. Point that out first. And the theory is that the air should sit higher than the barb. So uh, if you've got the tubes aiming down, the barbs are here. So this, these are our barbs. They've got flanges in them too. Um, so the barbs sit there. You want the air to be in a place where it's not just going to get sucked through because one, there's always going to be air in the loop no matter what. It's not a perfectly closed system. Two, over time, there's permeation. As I just said, these tend to get replaced in about five years. So as it permeates, you'll get more air in the loop. And you want the air to be higher than the barb because if it's mounted down at the bottom of the case, uh, you're, you're fighting, uh, you're fighting the, the risk of sucking air into the loop. So tubes aiming up will run into significant problems as stated by the manufacturers themselves. Uh, but with the tubes down, the air should be at the top of the tank, basically floating up with the liquid below it. So the liquid uh, should not be impeded by the air. That's, that's really the idea. Now, uh, to answer your question, when it's mounted like this versus like uh, this, it doesn't really matter. So like this is bad. You don't want the tubes on top, generally speaking. Uh, if you try it out, the pump noise will probably be lessened with the tubes like that on the bottom. But if you're looking at vertical mounting like this or horizontal if you prefer uh, to look at it that way this it's it doesn't matter it's because the tubes are down the air is going to be up so you're fine uh, it's really only when you're mounted this way that orientation matters a whole lot and don't install them at the bottom so that's all for this one uh, there are plenty more questions because it's been a while but please feel free to post your questions in the comment section below if you are a patreon backer at patreon.com slash gamers nexus you can join our discord chat it should send you to instructions on how to join. If not, there's an old post that has a link to it. Uh, and then you can post questions in the Ask Again section where I check them every episode. And I also check the comments section every episode. So as always, thanks for watching. Uh, Store.gamersnexus.net if you want to check out our new shirts, including the tri-blends of the GN Graph logo. Subscribe for more as always. I'll see you all next time.